Hello, doctors. How's everyone doing today? <clears throat> I'm sure we are all doing well. So I have a question. Today's topic is MCQ1 objective 3.3. That is um, approach to chronic abdominal pain. So when you see this objective, what comes into your mind? What are the things which come into your mind when you see this objective? So you remember that the, the exam is based on objectives, and that is what we have been preaching to all our candidates that follow the MCC objectives, follow the MCC objectives, follow the MCC objectives. So that's exactly what we are going to do today. And uh, we've covered a lot of the objectives, objective one, objective two, a lot of them. And now we are on objective 3.3. .3. So if you go to the MCC objective website, you realize that they state that Chronic or recurrent abdominal pain is a common symptom. And if you follow my class very well, I always say that, look, common things are common. Common things are common. So when the exam taking body itself is telling you that chronic recurrent abdominal pain is a common symptom. So I will make a note of that with extensive differential diagnosis. So that's another thing I want to pay attention to. So first, I need to know that chronic abdominal pain is common. Number two, extensive um, differential diagnosis. Therefore, if I'm studying, I'm going to maybe consider or make sure that I've mastered about seven top differentials for chronic abdominal pain, okay? And heterogeneous pathophysiology. The history and physical exam frequently differentiate amongst the causative disorders. So for example, when I am studying this, I know that if questions are going to be dropped on chronic abdominal pain, they are going to focus a lot on differentials, number one. Number two, they are going to focus on historical features which help to differentiate the various differentials. Number three, they're also going to focus on critical physical examination findings that are linked to these specific differentials. So that is what I will be, you know, preparing my mind for if I'm going into the exam. So, so the tip I will have for you is that based on the rationale alone, I will master at least seven top differentials of chronic abdominal pain. And then number two, how the various differentials of chronic abdominal pain can present in history and physical exam. So I have a question. This one, you can either unmute yourself or you can type. I think it would be better for us to type because we are going into the exam and we really want to know exactly what, what it says. So if you have a patient who comes to your clinic and says that they've been having this ongoing abdominal pain for the past, say, six months, what differentials will come into your mind? A patient, say, let me say, a 50-year-old male comes into your clinic with abdominal pain, which has been ongoing for the past six months, what differentials will you want to consider? I really want to see some answers. Okay, Dr. Kusanya went for GERD. Dr. Zainab went for IBS, that's irritable bowel syndrome. Any other differentials? I said that I want to master about seven top differentials. Any other differentials? Any other differentials you want to, you know, um, keep in? Two people have given us two differentials. Any other differentials? And those on Facebook, you can also... Beautiful. Okay, so Dr. Kusanya, you wrote pancreatitis. Which form of pancreatitis? Beautiful, Dr. Med. Diverticulitis. That's also wonderful. Beautiful. Dr. Abdul Wali says chronic pancreatitis, PID, chronic appendicitis, peptic ulcer disease. Well... Yeah, and Dr. Kusanya is going for oesophageal cancer as well. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. And Dr. Zainab is saying cholecystitis. So you realize that these are all critical diagnoses you must know if you want to really, really ace the exam. And I'll be taking you to, and, and what I'll also say is that with each of the differentials you've listed, you must know the historical features and you must know the physical exam findings as well. Because if you want to really, really ace the exam, then that is the approach you have to use. Okay. So, um, how to list differentials based on location? So, for example, if I 
states in your question stem that the 50 year old male, he has the chronic abdominal pain, but it's in the epigastric region. Now we are taking it to the next level. We are not just giving differentials just like that. The differentials you want to note can be number one. The differentials you want to note can be malignancy. It can also be um, um, ulcer or non peptic ulcer uh, dyspepsia. Okay. Okay. So if I say a 50 year old male presents with chronic abdominal pain, but it's more in the epigastric region or in the upper abdominal region, then your differentials, remember that I was teaching the last time that in your exam, always think about differentials which will kill the patient first or differentials which are more emergent or differentials which are, which are more serious. So for example, malignancy, because I know that someone wrote malignancy, so like low esophageal malignancy, stomach um, cancers, all those ones are there. Then you can also have ulcer and non-ulcer dyspepsia. Then you can also have biliary disease and the biliary disease can be cholecystitis, cholelithiasis, you know, recurrent cholelithiasis. Even, you can even consider something like kidney stones as well. Okay? And then pancreatic disease. So like something like someone wrote in the comment section like chronic pancreatitis. That's also very, very um, true. And then you can also have hepatic disease. And you can also have patients who have referred, um, who have referred pain. Patients who have referred abdominal pain. Okay, patients who have referred abdominal pain and that particular uh, abdominal pain or cardiothoracic pain causing epigastric uh, pain, which is also chronic. So this is, these are the differentials you want to look at. Number two, if the question had stated that this chronic abdominal pain is more in the lower abdominal region, then differentials you want to also consider can be inflammatory bowel disease. Differentials can also okay. diverticulitis. So, like what Dr. Omid what? diverticulitis. You can also write irritable bowel syndrome or even malignancy, like small bowel malignancy, large bowel malignancy. And there can also be genitourinary causes of chronic lower abdominal pain, like if it's a female, dysmenorrhea. And that's why I put in there consider the age. Okay benign or malignant tumors. And look, all these answers are also coming from the Medical Council of Canada itself. It is part of the, the write-up for the objective. So if you go to objective 3.3, this information is also there. So it's not only about your textbooks. The objective itself, how the objective has been structured, itself is a learning tool. So we've learned about upper, upper epigastric pain and then lower um, abdominal pain as well. Then I'll also want to take you to other things that other causes of chronic abdominal pain, which is not necessarily based on location. So for example, food allergies, food intolerances, and celiac disease, because celiac disease is a very common condition we see in our practice in Canada. So if I were you and I'm preparing for this exam, because the Medical Council of Canada itself has stated that celiac disease is one of the other causes of chronic abdominal pain, I will do my best to master that. Constipation, everybody knows about constipation. We know about the causes of constipation. We know about the, you know, the medications which cause constipation and all those things. And then musculoskeletal causes, because it could just be a musculoskeletal cause, which is causing you to think that this patient has, you know, something going on inside. And it could also be functional. So my approach to um, chronic abdominal pain is very simple. Basically, if I have a patient with chronic abdominal pain, um, I'm expecting to know the cause, the severity, the complications, and initiate an appropriate management plan. So with all these um, things we've talked about, constipation, I must know the cause. I must know how a patient with constipation will present. I must know the complications of constipation. I must know management of constipation. If I come to irritable bowel syndrome, I must know the same, the four things, cause, presentation, complications, management, diverticulitis, the same thing, inflammatory bowel disease, the same thing, ulcer and not ulcer dyspepsia. So today what I will do is, 
we're going to pick three of these top dimensions, and we're going to go through one, them one by one. I'm going to allow us to interact so that it's going to really help us to really appreciate exactly what this objective is about. So I have a question. Like if it's a CDM case, how will you be able to tell, or if it's an MCQ case, how will you be able to tell that this patient or this case which is being presented is a case of dyspepsia? What are the symptoms the patient will present with? Can someone tell, um, type or just maybe raise your hand and unmute and then let's have a conversation? If you are going into the exam and you see a patient who has presented with you know, chronic abdominal pain from whatever the, the, the case is, what are the telltale signs that will help me to know that this is a case of dyspepsia? So Dr. Shail is saying that postprandial fullness. Any other? And those on Facebook as well. You can also um you can also write your answers as well. I'll be following. Dysphagia. Dysphagia. Okay, let's see. Or, orophagia. Dysphagia. Orophagia. They can come with odinophagia. They can come yeah, with odinophagia. Hmm. Yes. Okay. Well, also go with chest Heart bones. Pain. Heart pain. Yes, go on. Yes, come in. Okay, good night. Okay, so chest pain. Hmm. Okay. Chest bones. It could come with chest bones. Chest burn. Okay. What else? So it could come uh, with change appetite. Change in appetite. Change in appetite. Okay. Yeah. But are these high yield points? So some intentional weight loss. Weight loss. As soon as you okay, so as soon as you start bringing in weight loss, and I'll, I'll be taking you there. Someone just said weight loss or dinophagia. Mm -hmm. What else? Uh, deficient anemia. Anemia. Uh -huh. As soon as you start getting into those ones, then you know that we've gotten into another realm. So, what are the common? What are the top four common symptoms of dyspepsia? Number one postprandial fullness. Remember that most of the time, dyspepsia is a benign condition. Postprandial fullness. The patient may present with early satiety. Number three, the patient may present with epigastric pain and epigastric burning. So I heard somebody giving me all those answers. Epigastric burning, epigastric pain, early satiety, postprandial fullness. This is what people usually present to the clinic with. But then I heard other answers like weight loss. Those ones are what we call the red flags. So I'm even happy I also brought that up. So let's review again. How will I be able to pick up that this case which is being presented to me, whether it is MCQs or CDM, is dyspepsia, number one. Postprandial fullness, please write it down. Number two, early satiety. Kindly write it down, number three. Epigastric pain, number four, epigastric burning. Most of the time, a patient with dyspepsia will not present with weight loss and the rest. However, there are things we call as red flags. And because red flags point to other things, so naturally, a patient with dysphagia, a patient with dyspepsia should not present with dysphagia. They should not present with odinophagia. So dysphagia is difficulty swallowing. Odinophagia is painful swallowing. They should not naturally present with unintentional weight loss. As soon as you get a patient who is being presented in the whether MCQ, CDM, whatever, with unintentional weight loss or early satiety with unintentional weight loss, you've moved from regular dyspepsia to a possible malignancy. Early satiety with dysphagia. Early satiety with odinophagia, early satiety with unexplained iron deficiency anemia, early satiety with persistent vomiting, early satiety with mass or lymph adenopathy, early satiety in a patient with a positive family history of upper GI cancer. Please, as soon as you see those ones, you've moved away from regular dyspepsia to possible malignancy. 
is that we all on the same page. Before I move on, let's 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 take this thing very carefully. We've looked at the common presentations or the common presenting symptoms of dyspepsia. However, there are some things which will cause you to change your mind about that particular diagnosis you are thinking about. And these are the ones I've listed here. Unintentional weight loss, dysphagia, odinophagia, iron deficiency anemia, persistent vomiting, palpable mass or lymph adenopathy, and family history of upper GI cancers. As soon as you see this, the game has changed. Start thinking about a possible malignancy. Start thinking about another differential apart from dyspepsia. Please, are we all on the same page? If you're all on the same page, kindly type yes, yes, yes. Because I really want us to, you know, make sure that we are dealing with this very well. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. I'm getting good responses. Beautiful. So we've learned our differentials. We are taking dyspepsia. We're learning the four top symptoms. Please, what are the four top symptoms? Can somebody help me? What are the four top symptoms of dyspepsia? Postprandial fullness, chest bones, early satiety, uh -huh. chest burn, chest pain and chest bones. epigastric pain and epigastric burning. Epigastric pain, epigastric burning. As soon as I start seeing these red flags, I go like, no, it can't be regular. Okay. Now, if a patient has dyspepsia, symptoms of dyspepsia, and I'm looking at my question stem, Patient has early satiety, early bloating. Remember that um, this exam is at the level of a medical student, right? And so at the level of a medical student, usually they want to know, okay, what is your next best step? Now, this is what I'm going to say. For the next best step um, um, management or investigation of a patient with dyspepsia, <laughs> please, one thing you need, to take in, you need to put in mind or one thing you need to keep in mind is the patient's age. Is the patient's age. When the patient is less than 60, there's a different approach you use. When the patient is more than 60, there's a different approach you use. So next best step questions, if you want to deal with it, look at the age they provide you. As soon as it is 60, consider something different. As soon as it is less than 60, consider something different. So we're going to look at it now. Okay, so for example, assuming I say this class that you have a 65-year-old gentleman who comes in with early satiety, postprandial fullness, and heaviness in the epigastric region after meals, what is your next best step? Endoscopy. Endoscopy, okay. What about if I say that Another patient presents with the same thing, but the patient is 40 years. What is going to be your next best step? Endoscopy with biopsy. We are looking for the red uh, flag. No, there, are no, there are no red flag signs. Assuming they just said postprandial fullness, early satiety, you know, epigastric pain after meals. And the patient is 40 years. What is your next best step? PPI. 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 Beautiful. So now it's two blockers. So now this is this is the this is the approach. First, if the patient, if the patient presents with postprandial fullness, early satiety, epigastric pain, and the questions, and the patient is anything more than 60 years, your next best step is upper GI endoscopy and gastric biopsy. That one non-negotiable. But if you have another patient who is presenting with the same thing and say the patient is 50 years, 45 years, number one, and the patient does not have any weight loss, like red, the red flag signs we discussed, weight loss, dysphagia, unintentional, you know, weight loss, no anemia, no persistent vomiting, no lymphadenopathy, you are not going to move directly to endoscopy. Rather, what you're going to do is that you're going to ask yourself, what is this patient presenting with? And if the patient is presenting with, you know, um, if the patient does not have any red flag signs, then your next step will be to test for H. pylori. But if the patient is more than 60 years, then you're going to go ahead 
and request for a PAGI endoscopy. Now, if the patient presents with something which is organic, like you know exactly what is happening, you already know that this patient has peptic ulcer disease, or then you want to treat that particular condition. So please, two things here. Number one, if the patient is more than 60, go straight for APAGI endoscopy. If the person is less than 60, but has red flag signs, weight loss, unexplained anemia, lymphadenopathy, epigastric mass, or something, go for APAGI endoscopy. However, if the patient is less than 60, but does not have any of those red flags, then you want to do an H. pylori test. If you do H. pylori test and the patient is negative for H. pylori, go ahead and give proton pump inhibitors. If you do H. pylori testing and the patient is positive for H. pylori, then go on to do your quadruple therapy for the management of H. pylori. Please, I want somebody to summarize that for us before we move on, because this is very critical. This is a board exam. Remember, this is not, you know, um, something you can just say, oh, this patient, I'm just going to request a, 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 um, an upper G endoscopy or not. What are the steps based on age? Can somebody help me? I want to hear from you. Hello, doctor. So, yeah. So basically, what we're, doctor, what you're saying is anybody above the age of 60 of dyspepsia, epigastric pain, epigastric fullness, regardless of lymphadenopathy or uh, or fullness, we're going to do endoscopy with biopsy. Yes. Right? Yes, and about go for biopsy and endoscopy. Right. So if you have somebody between the age of 40 and 60, we're going to go more of the conventional route. Yes. Like basically now we're going to look at if, if he does have weight loss, anemia, lymphadenopathy, gastric fullness, pain, uh, postprandial pain and fullness, we are going to do the endoscopy with biopsy. Yes. Now, if we don't have the lymphadenopathy, no anemia, no weight loss, we're going to go for H. pylori testing. Yes. Because the most common cause of gastritis is H, I guess, H. pylori, right? Mm -hmm. Dyspepsia. Continue. So, Continue. Right? So we're going to do the H. pylori testing. And then if it is positive, we treat. If it's not positive, we go back to PPIs. What are you going? No, no, no. Okay, yeah. You treat with your quadruple therapy. If not, then you treat with PPI for four to eight weeks. That's it. This is That's all right. you need to learn. This is all you need Thank to you. This is all you need to know, please. This is everything you need to know so far as a patient who is presenting with epigastric pain is concerned. Number one, are there any red flags? Number two, what's the age of the patient? These two things are going to direct you as to the direction you should go. Next best step, less than 60, no red flags, do H. pylori testing. Next best step, 60 or over, so far as the person is 60 or over, apogee endoscopy. That said, please, can I move on? Very good, doctor. Thank yes. you. Good. Now, how are you going to proceed? After the age barrier and the red flags are gone, so the patient is not 60, the patient does not have any red flag signs. So we said that you test for H. pylori. If you test for H. pylori, you can use the stool antigen test or the urea breath test. If H. pylori is positive, you eradicate H. pylori. By the way, who can tell me what's the combination therapy for management of H. pylori? May I? Yes, please, take P it. PPI, mm -hmm. two antibiotics, and the triple uh, uh, treatment. Uh, we are giving uh, clarithromycin with amoxicillin, mm -hmm. and the second choice is the PPI with clarithromycin with the uh, metronidazole. And the quad uh, therapy, we are giving PPIs plus BMT, uh, basemut salicylic acid with the metronidazole and tetracycline. Beautiful, 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 beautiful. Now, the, 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 the new teaching is that we are even using more of quadruple therapy and less of the triple therapy because the organisms have become more resistant to the triple therapy. So we move on. If H. pylori testing is negative, as we said, you give your proton pump inhibitor for four to eight weeks. This is another thing. Assuming I tell you in your questions then that this patient is 45 years, um, H. pylori test was negative. We've done 
um, proton pump inhibitors for about eight weeks, but we are not seeing any improvement. What is the next best step? The next best step is that you can give the patients a tricyclic antidepressant and a prokinetic. So tricyclic antidepressant can be amitriptyline, nortriptyline, and then a prokinetic can be metoclopramide, domperidone. Okay? Now, if that patient who is less than 60 years, who did not have any red flag signs, who was H. pylori negative, okay? Who you tried proton pump inhibitors on and it still did not help, whom you've tried amitriptyline and metoclopramide, all those things don't help. Then you go on to do a biopsy and an endoscopy. So you see, before you do a biopsy and an endoscopy in somebody who is less than 60 with no red flags, look at what you have to go through. Stepwise approach, please. This exam is a board exam. Can somebody summarize everything for us? Because I really want us to get to this. You can go. Okay, good. Sure, Dr. Okay. Frosa, let's go. Okay. So uh, a patient who is less than 60 years, that is 45 years, with dyspepsia, no alarming sign, then we have to, if there is alarming sign, uh, then we can go for... No, no, uh, don't worry. You tell me. I'll tell you whether there are alarm signs or not. So 45-year-old male with dyspepsia, what's your next best step? What's, what question will you ask? Uh, what what question do I ask? Is yes. there any weight loss, recent weight loss? No, none of those. So no red flag signs. What's your next step? Uh, we'll go for urea breath test. Okay, urea breath test was negative. Okay, urea breath test was negative. Then we'll go for four to eight weeks uh, proton pump inhibitor. Uh, patients, patients still came back after three months saying that the symptoms are there. We'll go for then um, this tricyclic antidepressant and uh, um, that is uh, prokinetics. And the patient said still symptoms are present after using it for two months. Then we'll go for bio endoscopy. endoscopy. That's all. That's all. That's all. This is this is, this is the approach you have to use. Okay. Yeah. So that is one main common differential of chronic abdominal pain. Master dyspepsia, master non-ulcer dyspepsia. Now let's go on to pancreatitis. Remember, this is not acute pancreatitis. This is chronic pancreatitis, chronic abdominal pain, chronic pancreatitis. Now, I have a question. Whether it's a CDM or MCQ, how will the patient with chronic pancreatitis present? How are you going to pick it up from a question stem? Can anyone give me any suggestions? Like the way we had suggestions for the acute, the, 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 the dyspepsia. Can anyone give me any suggestions? Yeah. Yes, back pain. Back pain. Okay. Mid epigastric pain. Mid epigastric pain. Mid epigastric pain. Radiated to the back. So epigastric pain, which radiates to the back. Okay. What else? Now vomiting. So now vomit. Nausea and vomiting. Mm -hmm. So if I have somebody with nausea and vomiting plus epigastric pain, which radiates to the back, the difference which should come to the top should be chronic pancreatitis. Someone was asking about alcoholism. What else? Uh, some people have a, some someone fever, probably. Well, chronic pancreatitis, would they really have fever? I don't think so. No. I don't think so, yeah. It's the really causes are, the causes are most common are stones, Dr. Brody, stones. Alcohol, some um, no. So you, I think, Doctor Omar, I think what you are talking about is causes of acute pancreatitis. Yes. Yeah, okay. We are looking at chronic pancreatitis. Yes. We have, yes. We have to know weight that loss. Weight loss. Okay. Let's see. So we, we you know, I, I'm sure you're talking about. I get smashed. Idiopathic. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hostones, ethanol, you know, trauma, yeah. all those things. <laughs> Those are the causes. They, they can be steatorrhea. Steatorrhea, beautiful, beautiful. Steatorrhea. What else? So since you talked about steatorrhea, what else can happen? Their stools can also float on the on the on the water closet. Okay. So let's 
get into it right away. How will I be able to pick up a patient with chronic pancreatitis? Number one, of course, a patient with chronic pancreatitis is not going to be a young person. So a patient with chronic pancreatitis, I'm expecting an adult, maybe someone. So I'm looking for, in a question step, I'm looking for somebody who is about 50 years and above, okay? Pain in the epigastric region, number three. Pain in the epigastric region, which are to the back. Nausea, vomiting, anorexia, postprandial epigastric pain. So you realize that the postprandial epigastric pain is similar in chronic pancreatitis and non-ulcer dyspepsia. But then the one, the thing in a board exam, which will give out chronic pancreatitis is that the pain radiates to the back, which radiates to the back. And um, there's also steatorrhea and there's oily or floating stool. These are the things you want to watch out for. If you just have somebody with postprandial epigastric pain, you can just use that alone to differentiate between non ulcer dyspepsia and chronic pancreatitis. But as soon as you start getting things like, oh, the stools are greasy, they, they, they float on the stools, they float on the water closet, then it starts getting into your mind that this could be a case of chronic pancreatitis. Now, if a patient has chronic pancreatitis, what labs would you request? You don't know Serum amylase, lipase. Serum lipase. Okay, so if you request serum amylase and lipase, what are you going to see? No, they are usually normal. <laughs> yeah, good. That is that is that yes. is the trick there. That is the trick there. If you have a patient who has been having recurrent abdominal pain for like four months, and the pain radiates to the back, and there's steatorrhea, and you are told that what investigation are you going to request? And you go with serum serum, and serum my mileage. That becomes a problem. So what is the yes. best investigation to request in that case? Abdominal x-ray. Abdominal x-ray. When you do an abdominal x-ray, what will you find? Calcifications. Calcifications. What will best delineate the pancreas apart from abdominal x-ray? Uh, CT scan. Beautiful. CT scan. And the is that will you be able to identify chronic pancreatitis on x-ray? So we're going to look at symptoms. So chronic pancreatitis, as it progresses, you realize that today, please write this one down. Amylase and lipase levels may not be elevated. Unlike acute pancreatitis, where amylase and lipase levels will be elevated. But I have another question. Assuming you were dealing with a patient with acute pancreatitis, which of these two will you go for, amylase or lipase, and why? Lipase. 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 Why? Lipase. Because amylase can also be produced by by what? Um, by salivary salivary glands. glands. If somebody has an infection of the salivary glands, they can also have an elevation in amylase level. Amylase. Yeah. But the lipase is more specific for the pancreas. However, we are learning today that. In case I get a case, epigastric pain in a 58-year-old male um, is been going on for like four months. Amylase levels and lipase levels are normal. That should not cause me to think that, oh, because amylase level and lipase levels are normal, the patient does not have pancreatitis. No, it could be that the patient has pancreatitis, but the pancreatitis the patient has may be chronic pancreatitis. So you want to watch out for that in the exam. So they are not tricked. Nobody tricks you. So when we're talking about the calcification, for example, assuming I present this picture to you in the exam, don't tell me this is arthritis. This is pancreatitis. This is chronic pancreatitis. So this is a picture with chronic pancreatitis with calcification. But someone said that the best way to see it would be on CT scan. So that's why I brought two, those two images. So this is the axial view, CT scan, and that is the pancreas with all the calcifications. And this is the um, uh, PA view, abdominal x-ray with the pancreas, which is going across the vertebrae. Please, are we all on the same page? So what are the learning points? Chronic pancreatitis, usually in a board exam, a minus level and lipase level will be normal. 
pain that radiates to the back, epigastric pain. If you are not careful, you may confuse that with non-ulcer dyspepsia. How am I going to differentiate between the two? Number one, chronic pancreatitis, the patient may present with stools which float on water. They may present with greasy stools. This is what, I, this is, what is going to get me to start thinking. Okay. Remember that a mileage level and lipase level will be normal. So, assuming you do, so let me give you this question. You have a 55 year old male has been having recurrent episodes of epigastric pain, radiates to the back. You were suspecting chronic pancreatitis and because of that requested a CT scan. The radiologist indicates that the CT scan is inconclusive. What is your next best step? MRCP. MRCP. ERCP. MRCP. Secreting test. Secreting test. Secreting test. Or endoscopic ultrasound. Please write these things down. Very important. First. Chronic pancreatitis will have normal lipase, normal amylase levels. Next step, I can request abdominal imaging. That is abdominal X-ray, abdominal CT scan. If abdominal X-ray and abdominal CT scan are inconclusive, the next step, not MRCP and ERCP, those ones you are using them for, like if the patient has a stone or if MRCP, you are thinking that maybe the patient has pancreatic cancer. But if I really want to diagnose pancreatic, chronic pancreatitis, lipase level was normal, amylase level was normal, did a CT scan, did an abdominal x-ray, they were inconclusive. The next step would be to request a secreting test, secreting level. Secreting is a measure of the um, productive nature of the pancreas. So I either do a secreting test or I do an endoscopic ultrasound. Those two. Those two. Remember, lipase and amylase will be normal in the board exam. Number two, I'll request an abdominal x-ray or an abdominal CT, which will help me to diagnose it well. If those are inconclusive, I'll go a secreting test or endoscopic ultrasound. Please, am I making sense here? If anyone has any yes. Please ask Hello, Chief. before we move on. Yes, please. I, I un Hello, Chief. I understand the request secreting level, which measures the level of the amylase and the lipase. So how would the endoscopic ultrasound scan, what would that be? What what will it sh show you for it you to show, have? To show you the, 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 the pancreas itself. Like you see the morphology of the pancreas and you realize that, oh no, this pancreas does not look, look normal. Okay. Mm -hmm. So two things which will help you to diagnose chronic pancreatitis in fetal secreting levels and endoscopic ultrasound. Is this lesson opening up some things for us? Is it helping us well, to say certain things? Very well. This is uh, Dr. Bruni, sorry. This, is, um, this two test is the, the diagnostic test. Yes, it's a diagnostic test. Yeah. I need more clarification on the endoscopic ultrasound. What will be the request? So, oh no, you did. So, endoscopic ultrasound, you, su you still Which suspect. So, it's an, an, an like the, it, it goes in, it goes in through the mouth. So, they go with a, like the camera and everything, and then they, they scan. And that's one, it helps them to see, like to, to get a closer view of the pancreas. So they can look at the morphology of the pancreas itself. So like the way you do apogee endoscopy and all that, the gastroenterologists have their own way. Okay. And then, yeah, they go through the esophagus into the stomach and then they scan. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So we remember that one of the objectives and one of the key things in the objectives is complications. Complications. So what are some of the complications of chronic pancreatitis? Chronic pancreatitis. What's the sound? Pancreatic like? cancer. Pancreatic cancer because of the recurrent inflammation. What else? 
What do you say? Diabetes. Diabetes, beautiful. Yeah. Some some call it pancreatic diabetes. That is mm -hmm. diabetes type 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 three B. Um, um, ascites. Um, what do you say? Ascites. Beautiful. Now that you mentioned ascites, where else can fluid collect? Since we are talking about the complications of panc chronic pancreatitis, and you just mentioned pseudocyst, pseudocyst, pancreatic pseudocyst. Beautiful. So the fluid can collect around the pancreas itself as a pancreatic pseudocyst. The fluid can collect in the abdominal cavity. And where else? Look at look at the pancreas here. I'm just showing you this. Look at the pancreas here. Where else can fluid collect? Well, so far as the fluid is in the abdomen and you 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 assess the part of the glass, you see it. But where else? Where else? Where else will you see fluid? Cholelectasis. No, 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 no. I'm talking about areas where fluid can be collected. So far as chronic pancreatitis is concerned, we said that it can collect around the pancreas itself, it can collect in the abdominal cavity. Where else? Look at it here. It's close to what? The lungs. Where mm -hmm. and what will happen? Effusion. 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 So another thing is that because the pancreas also has an exocrine function, it can lead to osteopenia. Osteopenia. It can also even lead to chronic pancreatitis can lead to osteoporosis. Osteopenia, osteoporosis, mm -hmm. diabetes. And then because they have regular ongoing pain, they can also develop opioid dependency because they come, you give them the pain management, they go home, it comes back again. Then we are looking at the various places fluid can collect, pancreatic pseudocyst, pleural effusion, ascites. And then there can also be bile duct obstruction. There can be duodenal obstruction. There can be splenic vein thrombosis. But these are all high falutin stuff. For me, going into an exam like this, what are the complications of chronic pancreatitis? Number one, because of the exocrine function, osteopenia and osteoporosis. Number two, diabetes. Number three, pancreatic pseudocyst. Number four, ascites. Number five, blood effusion. If I can be able to master these, and then I will not also forget that since the patient is having recurrent inflammation that can even lead to a cancer so pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma or pancreatic adenocarcinoma if you write it that way you so you will also be right so these are the these are the complications of chronic pancreatitis i want to keep in mind i will not want to go into all the details of everything just these about six complications i'm okay if i'm asked i should be able to produce about four or five that's how to go for the exam. Any question about chronic pancreatitis or somebody wants to um, 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 somebody wants to summarize chronic pancreatitis for us, remember we are still reviewing chronic abdominal pain and we are looking at some of the very, very common complications of chronic abdominal pain. Does anyone have any question or any insightful thing the person has um, come to realize while we are going through this, the step-by-step -step approach, does somebody want to say something before we go to the last, the last topic, which I think is very important as well? Because the last, we are looking at common causes of chronic abdominal pain. We've looked at chronic pancreatitis. We've looked at non-ulcer dyspepsia. Okay, so now, since we looked at all these things and the, the, the MCC objective itself says that we have to know the symptoms and the, from the history. Celiac disease is also one very common cause of chronic abdominal pain. So what are the things in the exam that will cause me to think that this patient's presentation is celiac disease? What are some of them? Steatoria. Somebody chronic say, diarrhea. Theatoria. Chronic diarrhea. What else? Weight loss. What? 
Weight loss. Malabsorb malabsorption. Maybe? Okay. Malabsorption. What else? Abdominal cramping, pain. Abdominal cramping and pain. You can come with the um, it can be dehydrated, yeah. Dehydration. No. Okay, what else? Nausea and vomiting. Nausea and vomiting. Dermatitis and vomiting. That's what I wanted to hear. You know, um, because in, in a, a board exam, is a board exam. So what are extra intestinal manifestations of celiac disease? And that's what um, dermatitis and vomiting. So, and I hope you are, you'll be able to pick up a case of dermatitis and vomiting if you see it. I'll show you a picture. So, how will you be able to pick up celiac disease? If they, you have a patient who has unexplained iron deficiency anemia. Number two, unexplained folate deficiency. Number three, unexplained vitamin B12 deficiency. Number four, you realize that the patient has persistent elevation in the serum amino transferases. Number five, hep dermatitis hepatiformis. And dermatitis hepatiformis, you must be able to see it, spot, diagnose it, and say, this is dermatitis hepatiformis. So you have a patient who has iron deficiency anemia, like on lab work, and then the patient is also presenting with fatigue, or the patient is presenting with recurrent headaches, or the patient is presenting with recurrent fetal loss, or low birth weight in the baby, or subfertility, or persistent ulcers in the mouth plus anemia, persistent ulcers in the mouth plus vitamin B12 deficiency, persistent ulcers in the mouth plus folate deficiency. One diagnosis should click in my mind, celiac disease. Premature osteoporosis. So usually we expect patients who are older to have osteoporosis, but assuming I get a 32 year old female with osteoporosis, my goodness, what is going on here? Celiac disease should be one of my differentials. 32-year-old female with tingling and numbness in the hands and folate deficiency or and unexplained iron, iron deficiency anemia. Celiac disease should be one of my differentials. 32-year-old female with non-hereditary cerebellar ataxia. One of my top differentials should be celiac disease. Hello, doctors, can I proceed? Can I proceed? Very good, doctor, doctor. thank you. Okay. All right. So please, this is how the hepatitis, uh, dermatitis hepatiformis looks like. You know, it looks very red with all, if, if I show you this in a mock exam, you should be able to pick it up. If I should tell you that somebody comes in very tired with tingling in the hands and a female has had three recurrent abortions and then I show you this and I ask you, what is your diagnosis? Your diagnosis is not necessarily dermatitis hepatiformis. Your diagnosis is celiac disease. But this skin manifestation is dermatitis hepatiformis. Doctors, please, are we all on the same page? I yes. really want us to make sure. Yes. Yeah, I really want us to make sure that we are picking yes. things um, very well. Yes. Now, assuming you want to um, this, I can drop this as an MCQ. Assuming you want to investigate a patient with suspected celiac disease, what will you tell the patient about his diet or her diet? The gluten, gluten free. Gluten free diet. Gluten free diet is advisable. No. Gluten-free diet is part of your management. If okay. you want to diagnose a patient with celiac disease, they should still eat food containing gluten. FODMAPs diet? Small, small intestine biopsy, the, the diagnostic. Sure, we will go there. But then yeah. they should be on a gluten-containing okay. diet yes. before we do the test. Because if they stop taking gluten-containing diets for some time, it can give the results of the investigation a false negative answer and that can be a bit confusing so what if the patient comes to you 
with unexplained anemia, unexplained folate deficiency, unexplained vitamin B12 deficiency. You know, you don't have any reason why this 32 year old patient should have osteoporosis. And you're thinking, this could be celiac disease. Tell the patient, continue eating what you are eating. And then we're going to do the, the lab work. Okay, so now, how am I going to assess a patient with suspected celiac disease? Number okay. one, if there is no probability of celiac disease, then the next best step will be serologic testing. That is where you do immunoglobulin A anti-tissue um, yeah. antibody. This is the most sensitive test for celiac disease. Most sensitive serologic test, sorry. Now, if the serologic test, that is immunoglobulin IgA anti-tissue uh, antibody is positive, then you do an upper GI endoscopy plus small bowel biopsy. Let me take it again. If the patient you are assessing, you are concerned about, hmm, could it be that this patient has celiac disease? But you are not very sure, like, you know, it's not very high in your, in your, in your differentials. Then you want to do the immunoglobulin A anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody. Assuming you do that and it comes back positive, the next best step would be to do an upper endoscopy with small bowel biopsy. However, if you the patient presents with you know, dermatitis epitiformis, you know, um, vaccine B12 deficiency with folate deficiency, recurrent pregnancy losses, then you don't even worry yourself doing the two-step approach. You rather do both the serologic testing and biopsy of the small intestine. So if the, if the patient already has symptoms which makes the likelihood of celiac disease very high, then I will not do one and then come and do the other. I'll do both. It is when my consideration for celiac disease is less that I will do the immunoglobulin anti-tissue transglutaminase antibody. And then if that comes back positive, then I'll do the biopsy. However, you can also have somebody who is taking a gluten-free diet and the patient comes to you and you are still thinking, could this patient have celiac disease? What step will you take? The step you need to take is you just have to follow this algorithm from up to date. If the patient is on a gluten-free diet, if the question tells you the patient is on a gluten-free diet, then you have to do an HLA genotyping. For example, the patient has been on a gluten-free diet all her life. Then do the HLA genotyping. If HLA genotyping is negative, then you've excluded celiac disease. However, if the HLA genotyping is positive, then you do a gluten challenge in that patient who has been gluten-free all her life for about two weeks. And then after that, you do the serologic testing and the biopsy. Please, I want somebody to state this for me again. I want somebody to explain what I just said with this flow chart for me, please. I want somebody to explain what I just said. Okay, a patient comes to you. Oh, oh, no, you do it. You do it. I, I got it, doctor. You do it. You do it. Please do it. Uh, no, no, it's okay. You can do it. Um, so, okay. Uh, so, so we have we have a patient that presents with symptoms, and we want now we would like to do what we call transglutaminase testing. If transglutaminase testing is positive, then we do upper upper endoscopy with small bowel biopsy. Mm -hmm. Correct? Mm -hmm. Now, if the patient is already on a gluten-free diet, now you said you have to take be taking gluten in order for you to display in order for the transglutaminase upper endoscopy and small bile biopsy to become positive. Now, in in this case, if he's already on a gluten free diet, you might get a false negative. So therefore, you have to do what we call HL uh, uh, HLA testing. Mm -hmm. If it's negative, you don't exclude the disease. If it's positive, 
then we again we have celiac disease, and then we continue uh, no, being no, no, challenged. No. As the HLA genotyping is positive. Positive. It, we have that, to go for gluten challenge. You, mm -hmm. Remember that the patient yeah, has, has not been taking any gluten all her life or all his life. So then you do a gluten challenge, and then challenge. have a gluten challenge for about two weeks. Then what do you do? Then that is when biopsy. you do the celiac serology and biopsy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um. Um, I, I really want us to make sure that we've gotten a good grasp of these things. With chronic chronic um, abdominal pain, the top differentials we should learn, and I'm going to tell you after this. So go ahead. Dr. Brony? Yes, please. Uh, so I have this question. So in gluten challenge for two weeks, when will we do the biopsy after two weeks? Like after when, the if two it's... Weeks. Yes, after the two weeks. After oh, the two okay. weeks. And if after the two weeks it is negative, you 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 give another gluten challenge for another two weeks and repeat. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So please tonight before you sleep, chronic abdominal pain. Very simple. We've dealt with the three top common differentials. However, one other differential I think you should also focus on should be inflammatory bowel disease, diverticulitis, and irritable bowel syndrome. These three, please review them for this menorrhea. You will review them in gynecology. But before you sleep tonight, make sure you've mastered inflammatory bowel disease. Make sure you've mastered the difference between Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Which one is from mouth to bum? Which one is just with the um, colon? Which one is transmural? Which one affects only the mucosa? What are the extra intestinal manifestations of inflammatory bowel disease? That's number one. Number two, diverticulitis. What are the risk factors? How will the patient present? If a patient presents with acute diverticulitis, what will you do? When are you going to do, you know, um, 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 when are you going to do an endoscopy or a colonoscopy? Irritable bowel syndrome. So today we've done three of the top differentials. I also want you to review those other three. So we've reviewed non-ulcer dyspepsia. Number two, we've reviewed chronic pancreatitis. We've gone through the stepwise approach to the diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis. And we've also gone through how we're going to diagnose and manage a patient with celiac disease. We learned um, the stepwise approach to somebody who has a low probability of celiac disease somebody who has a high probability of celiac disease and somebody who has been on a gluten-free diet for a very long time. What do we do? We've seen other things which are associated with celiac disease. Anemia, vitamin B12 deficiency, folate deficiency, numbness. Um, we've learned after ulcers, subfertility, recurrent pregnancy losses, recurrent headaches, fatigue, dermatitis epitiformis. We've learned that we are not going to miss the metastasis epitomomies for anything. I have a question. What are your take home points today from this objective? Because we did not just deal with the objective. So it's like we've discussed three major conditions. What are your take home points today? So you realize that, look, it's not enough to just say, oh, I'm going to learn to, to notes. No. What we did here is not about going to read a bunch of things to forget. It's rather about how am I going to get the thing into my mind so that in the board exam, I will not be deceived or I will not be swayed in any way, shape or form. So I have a question. What are your learning points? You can pick any of the conditions. You can pick the differentials. You can pick anything and talk about it. I want to really listen to you. What are your learning points today? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I've seen, um, I've been able to see um, dyspepsia. Then I've seen the features associated with it, the clinical symptom in which they present with as um, postpandial fullness, at least a CST, chest pain, then chest burns. And when they come with um, some constitutional symptoms like weight loss, persistent vomiting, then there's equally a family history. I should be thinking of 
possible malignancies. Beautiful. Yeah. And um, for the age range, their age is equally a factor, mm -hmm. you know, for me to be thinking of um, malignancy. So I should be very, um, I should be very careful of the age range. For example, like age range of um, when you have um, a patient that is 60 years and above, what should come to my mind is should be, you know, um, I should be thinking of malignancy with the, um, with those constitutional symptoms and equally, and um, what should be my investigation measures, which will um, help me diagnose such. I should be able to use my um, endoscopy and biopsy. Then for if the patient is uh, less than um, 60, within the age range of 40, you know, I should be thinking of, um, <clears throat> I should rule out malignancies, you know. So the right I should think of, I should not think of malignancies. Yes, that's what I mean. Yeah, having the symptoms of uh, uh, postpandal fullness, early satiety, chest pain, or the fissure and the um, chest burns, you know. Then what will I use to? I should I should really be thinking of. Uh, um. H. pylori, yeah, I should be testing of H. pylori, yeah. Then um, I could also use, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's, then, good. Uh, that's good. So you do your H. pylori testing. H. pylori, H. pylori testing, positive. urea bread test, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just but to rule out. H. pylori is negative, then you do a four to eight week proton pumping. Eight time. week, yes. Four then after two, which... Mm -hmm. Then I'll do my uh, four to eight, yes, four to eight, eight weeks. weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Then we'll give tricyclic antidepressants. And then after okay. which, if it doesn't respond, I'll use my SSRI. Then um, no, 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 no. Tricyclic antidepressants. Tricyclic antidepressants. Yeah. yeah. Till it's present, then we'll go for a biopsy and endoscopy. Biopsy if it doesn't respond to yeah. Exactly. And then we also learned about chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis, where yeah. we saw the clinical presentations like uh, stetoria, then yeah. floating of the stool, mm -hmm. oily, uh, when you see it presents with um, like oily stool, yeah. then uh, we'll be, we'll, we'll, we're able to look at the what you use in investigating them, which um, we, we, we talked about the ratio of the amylase and the lipase. Which will be of equal ratio, you know. It will be normal. This part we we known to the fact normal. that yes, which is normal. Mm -hmm. Then which we know that uh, um, initially I have not known that an acute pancreatitis to be specific is light piece, and um, we've seen some of the cons um, um, equally we could also use to 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 be specific. To make the diagnosis, we could also use a uh, abdominal ultrasound, abdominal CT, yes, and um, secreting. What else again? Mm -hmm. Secreting test. Secreting test. Yes, yeah, secreting test, which I've mentioned that the ratio between the amylase and the lipase. Then we'll call this the constitution, um, the the complications which will also arise. Yeah. As. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, pleural effusion can come from there, then DM, diabetes mellitus, then could see formation of stones, then uh, osteo, uh, is it arthritis or so? Yeah. No, osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. Hmm. Yes, osteoporosis. And then we said they can also gather fluid around the pancreas itself, in the abdomen, and in the pleural, in the pleural spaces. And we also said that because of the chronic inflammation, it can also lead to yes. pancreatic adenocarcinoma, right? Yes. Right. And then after that, we came to celiac disease and we learned um, that if a patient has celiac disease or you are suspecting celiac disease, encourage the patient to continue taking the gluten-containing food so that you can do your test. Because if they stop it, it can give you a false negative result. Now, if the patient has been um, gluten-free all their lives, then what you can then do is to um, 
do the HLA test. If that comes back negative, then you've ruled out um, celiac disease. But if it comes back positive, then you do the gluten challenge test for about gluten challenge for about two weeks. Then you go on to do your serologic testing and your biopsy. If those still come back negative, then you do another gluten challenge for about two to four weeks, then you retest again. And we also learned the extraintestinal manifestation of celiac disease, that is dermatitis hepatiformis, which you should be yeah. able to pick up as a spot yeah. diagnosis. Spot well. diagnosis, yes. Dr. Bruni? Yes, what, What's the management for chronic uh, pancreatitis? Like, uh... So, yeah, so most of the time, chronic pancreatitis, the main thing is, are there any complications which are arising from that? So if the patient has developed diabetes, you want to manage the diabetes. If the patient has developed, you know, um, osteoporosis, you want to avert that with like things like um, alendronate, calcium, vitamin D, you know, all those ones. Our um, main goal in the management is the pain management or we can do this sphincterotomy if this, and we can put this stunt if duct is dilated. Exactly. So that's, so if the ampulla or veta or the, uh, the 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 um the area of, like Santorini that area is 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 has a stricture then you want to dilate it so that the pancreatic enzymes can flow. Um, yeah, and for steatoria that. we can do the pancreatic enzyme replacement. Exactly, you can give that. But then can we do a surgery for? Can we do a surgery for the pancreas chronic pancreatitis? Uh, you don't want to usually take away the pancreas because of its you know functions, right? Because if you take it away then that means the patients will probably have to become dependent on insulin for the rest of their lives and everything. Because at times it takes a long time for the pancreas to lose its function totally. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to go in and just take it out. You want to do medical management and manage the issues which come up. If it's osteoporosis, you want to deal with it. If it's diabetes, you want to deal with it. If it then becomes adenocarcinoma, then maybe you may want to take it out and maybe do a, a pancreatic transplant or something, but that would be a bit far-fetched, All right? Thank you.